Without truth, there can be no justice. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Speak out! Ask those questions! Demand that truth! Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 6 of Truth is Justice. I want to start this episode talking a little bit about some of the messages that we've received during the week. And specifically, we've had an increase in the number of emails and messages received from those that follow Bob's show, asking us to stop our podcast focus on his show and instead turn our attention to other cases. Now, obviously, we won't be doing that. And if anything, the increase in the number of those types of messages we've been receiving means we're doing something right. But I wanted to examine the words used in those emails a little bit and explain to you why they confuse me. A reason I'm confused is surely any focus on this case supports the public intention of Bob's show being to uncover the truth and ensure that there is justice for Jim. If we raise something that Bob got wrong, even if we claim it was intentionally missed or deliberately downplayed, then surely that correction, the highlighting of what was wrong, has to be a good thing. It gives Bob the opportunity to reassess that particular element of his investigation and allows him the chance to improve it and focus again on something that deserves a closer, more thorough look. I'm talking about discussions on evidence that, when they're considered carefully, are quite simply and purely wrong. Surely an improper analysis, an incorrect analysis, is the very thing Bob and his show would want to avoid, because it's the very thing that they claim is what puts people like Sandra behind bars. Surely if justice for Jim was the goal, you would want the analysis to be airtight. You would want it to be able to stand up to scrutiny, and survive some prodding. If it can't survive prodding and a little bit of debate from people who are able to identify problems with it, then what actual value is it serving Jim? And what value is it serving Sandra, beyond simply publicity of the case and entertainment? Now, to those people who view our podcast as somehow interfering with Bob's work or the purpose of his army, consider this. If the intention is truly for justice for Jim, surely any good analysis, which I believe we are doing, has to be a positive thing. If Bob tells you A, and we analyse that, and when I say we, I mean not just those working on this project, but the amazing people who are on our Facebook group discussion who are doing some incredible work behind the scenes. So we do that and we work out that actually Bob got that wrong and he should have told you B, not A. Then surely that allows you to get closer to providing that justice for Jim. You don't go down a rabbit hole following A when a little bit more analysis and some objective consideration showed that that was the wrong path to take. If you instead follow B, you will arrive at the correct conclusion far more efficiently. I've spoken a lot over the opening episodes about how Bob's show is just that. It's a show. It's about entertainment and ratings and generating profit. It has to generate profit. As Bob says, that is his business, making money off the podcast. There's nothing wrong with that per se. Everyone needs to make a living, and if you find something that works and you're good at it, and people support that, then by all means, you pursue it. What I am saying is, if the intention is truly honourable, if the intention is for justice for the victim, in this case Jim, then a focus on that and a focus on getting the facts right has to be the top priority, right? What other conclusion can you draw? I have a message for those followers of Bob's who believe our project is harmful or disruptive or damaging to actually finding the truth. And I ask you to consider these questions. What about our project, about our podcast, our website, our Facebook discussions? What about all of that makes you upset? What about that actually bothers you? And when you hear us talk about elements of the case that Bob has got wrong, 
not just potentially wrong, but drastically, recklessly, in my opinion, wrong, does that change the way you consider the information that he's providing to you? If not, why? Are you interested in ensuring that the information that you receive is actually accurate? And finally, I think it's worth asking yourself, what's more important? The accuracy and the relevancy and the validity of information that you're being provided with through shows like Bob's, or the entertainment value of those shows. Now, if it's the entertainment value of the shows, then that's perfectly fine, and I understand why our focus on the truth represents a problem. But if it's important to you that you're receiving accurate, valid, and truly legitimate information, then I think you should take a close look at exactly the material that you're being provided with by shows like Bob's, and apply some independent and objective thinking to it. You can start with information available on our website and by viewing some of the discussions that are taking place in our Facebook group. The discussions there are objective, they're independent, and they're not influenced by financial priorities or loyalties to any particular group, nor are they motivated by a desire to ensure the longevity of a wrongful conviction record. We started Truth is Justice not out of anger or any type of bitterness. We started Truth is Justice to correct statements that we saw were blatantly incorrect, blatantly false, and in our opinion designed entirely to mislead. And we saw attacks on people who are entitled to far better, who deserve far better. We wanted to ensure that we were able to provide a method for the truth to be communicated and for justice to be attainable through objective, independent thought. And we believe that we are doing that, and we are very, very proud of what we have achieved so far. And there is so much more to come. Remember that we are only just getting started. And for your support through your messages and your participation in the Facebook group, we thank you all very much. We are Truth is Justice, and we are setting the record straight. This week, we look at episode 6 of Bob's show, the crime scene photos, and the accompanying report from Mr. Maurice Carpenter. Now, Bob begins the episode by acknowledging that Mr. Carpenter took nearly 1,000 photos, that he had the entire scene videotaped, and that he compiled his findings into a supplemental report. But then, almost immediately, begins to distract you from what Mr. Carpenter actually prepared. I'll explain what I mean. Bob notes that his job, and the job of his show and the audience, is to analyse the report prepared by Mr Carpenter and to see if he missed anything. But ask yourself what is used to reference whether Mr Carpenter misses anything in the report. It's the photos. The photos that are supposed to be viewed in conjunction with, actually supposed to be viewed at least on equal footing with, the report that is prepared. So when Bob refers to matter A, that he claims Mr Carpenter missed, it wasn't missed, it was covered in a photograph exactly what Mr Carpenter intended. And you'll see some incredible examples of that as we progress through the episode. In this episode, Bob goes room by room, following the report by Mr Carpenter, and that is exactly what we are going to do. We'll follow the room by room analysis. Mr Carpenter begins at the front door. And Bob notes that there is nothing significant there, and nothing he disagrees with Mr Carpenter on. He doesn't disagree with the number, or the style, or the type of photos that were taken. And Bob then moves on to the southeast corner bedroom. And this is the bedroom that used to be Liz's bedroom, Jim and Sandra's daughter. Now Bob notes that he doesn't see any problems, other than what Mr Carpenter describes as being a guitar case is actually, as Bob notes, not a guitar case, but a harp case. And how's this confirmed? Yep, through the photos, the photos which accompany Mr Carpenter's report. And that'll be the theme as we progress through this episode. Bob notes that it isn't so much what Mr Carpenter describes, it's more what he leaves out. Bob notes that Mr Carpenter describes the room as having nothing out of place, whilst Bob states that in his opinion, someone came into that room and looked through all the drawers for something valuable. And the jewellery box, to quote Bob, looks like it has been ransacked. Somebody opened it, including the internal drawer, likely looking for anything of value. Bob describes in detail the open jewellery box. He refers to the open doors, the open drawer within the jewellery box, 
and he notes that it gives the appearance that someone was looking through the jewellery box. It's very important to note that there are multiple photos of the jewellery box, again photos that accompany the report. Go to our website and click on the southeast corner bedroom to see those photos, or look in our show notes and we'll provide the exact links to each room. Bob goes on to highlight the watch and the bracelet, which are located on the floor, and states that he would have included those in the report. Now, it's important to note that the watch and the bracelet on the floor are photographed specifically, so they were not missed. They were well and truly identified in the photos which accompany the report. Now, Bob mentions the poster on the wall next to the dresser, and as Bob describes it, right next to the jewellery box. Bob describes how the left corner of the poster is ripped off the wall, just above the watch and bracelet, which Bob describes as lying mysteriously on the floor. And Bob notes the drawer of DVDs and makes reference to a singular Xbox game. And he makes specific mention that if it was him, a notation would have been made to ask the family if anything was missing from that drawer, as Xbox games, according to Bob, have a significant resale value. We can highlight here that Bob's reference to a single Xbox game being in that drawer is wrong. There are actually four Xbox games visible, and potentially several more, we can't see below that top layer. So as for Bob's statement that Xbox games have a significant resale value, four games were left apparently untouched. To me it appears that the drawer wasn't disturbed at all. The drawer has a pile of cases on the left hand side, with an Xbox game sitting on the top. In my view, if an intruder had searched that drawer for Xbox games, they likely would have checked that left pile to see if there were a pile of Xbox games under it. But no, it all looks relatively untouched. Then Bob moves on to the jewellery box. And note that this isn't suggested as a possibility or a potential scenario. No. It is noted as what exactly took place. That the jewellery box was ransacked by someone looking for anything of value. And Bob also determines that the burglar was likely nervous or in a hurry, evidenced by the dropped watch and bracelet. And this is where the poster is incorporated into the burglar scenario. Bob notes that it could be that the burglar tried to catch the falling items, and in doing so, caught the edge of the poster, ripping the corner off the wall. Now on a side note, this statement by Bob, and several of those on the connected Facebook pages, are actually something I recall noticing very early on in my involvement with this case. I thought about the poster, and Bob's claim that it was torn off by an intruder grabbing for the jewellery. I actually recall reading a post by someone on one of the pages stating how the torn poster was a clear sign to them of a burglar. I remember asking the author of that post what they meant, as I looked at the photo and I couldn't understand quite what they were referring to. The reply I received was interesting. They stated that they hadn't viewed the photos, they were just going off what Bob had described. And that's an important point to highlight. This particular listener of Bob's wasn't concerned with confirming the details that Bob raised, they relied on Bob to be reflecting the truth. I remember explaining how I saw the photograph, and the listener noted that how I described the photograph was different to how Bob had described it. They noted that following our conversation, they would go off and have a look for themselves, and make up their own mind on the basis of the photo. For those not familiar with the setting, I'll try and describe it. And we have a dresser with a jewellery box sitting on top, and the jewellery box has doors that open outwards to the left and to the right, has two internal shelves, and it has a drawer that pulls out. The poster is located on the wall to the right of the dresser. Now, the top left corner of the poster has indeed fallen from the wall. Torn? Well, I don't think so. I wouldn't describe it in that way. Now, as it sits, if you pull up that left corner, it sits perhaps a couple of inches from the top of the jewellery box. Now, if you get a chance to have a look at the photos, and we'll put the link in the show notes, Please have a look at them, because there's several marks on the wall, well above the height of the jewellery box, but in line with where you might expect the poster putty or the blue tack to be when the poster was properly affixed to the wall. That's considerably above the height of the jewellery box, so keep that in mind. Now the jewellery box has multiple necklaces draped over one of the doors, the door to the right close to the poster. Now, it would appear that the necklaces have been deliberately draped over that door in a way almost to store them or to display them, make them easier to sort through or to find. Now would an intruder sorting through the jewellery box, nervously and in a hurry, take the time to drape the necklaces over the door of the jewellery box to store them neatly? Well, that seems pretty unlikely in my opinion. If they did, then that would be completely in conflict with the suggestion that they had, in some type of nervous panic, 
dropped the bracelet and watch and tried desperately to grab them as they fell. The other thing about the necklaces draped over that side door is with them draped in that way, the door wouldn't be able to be closed. So let's consider all of this for a minute. And I think it's probably helpful if we did a little experiment just to see how plausible what Bob's suggesting is. And you'll need a few things to do this. You need some poster putty or blue tack, a sheet of paper to stick up, a dresser, a shoebox or something similar, and a set of keys. Now place the shoebox on top of the dresser, sitting on its base, and close to the right hand edge of the dresser, maybe an inch or so from the right hand side. Use the putty to stick the sheet of paper or a poster to a wall about three inches above and two inches to the side of the shoebox on the right hand side of the dresser. Now place the keys on top of the shoebox. Now knock the keys off the shoebox and try and catch them. Where does your hand go? Now, if you try it a few more times, does your hand get anywhere near the poster on the wall? Well I've done the same experiment and tried to replicate the actual distances based on the photograph and I can't seem to get even close to creating a situation where I touch the poster, let alone grab the top edge of it and pull it off the wall. Now it might seem like a silly experiment to do, and in many ways it is, but it's the best way to show that the suggestion that an intruder pulled that poster off the wall is simply not even remotely plausible. I grew up hanging posters on my wall as a child, probably like most of you, and I remember forever struggling with the posters falling down, corners dropping off, etc. The sheets of paper are generally okay, but as soon as you use anything heavier, the corners just seem to fall away. I don't know if it was the humidity or the type of putty or blue tack that I was using, whether it would work for a short time and then you'd have to take it off and manipulate it a little bit and reapply it, but I actually recall exactly the same thing happening in school classrooms. Now it lasts for a little while, but anything with a bit of weight, like a poster, and the right environment, and it would come loose. And that is what we have here. Now. I don't want to dwell on that much longer, I just want to make the point that because something is described in a particular way, it doesn't mean that the photos show that. So just because Bob describes a scene as being one where the jewellery box has been ransacked and the poster supposedly torn off the wall, doesn't mean that that is the case. The jewellery box appears to be open simply as a matter of course, as evidenced by the necklaces draped over the door, and the poster appears to have fallen away from the wall over time. Nothing nefarious, it simply fell away. And to finish this room, Bob notes that it's clear that someone was in that southeast corner bedroom that night, whether it was Sandra staging the crime scene or an intruder. Now I'm not sure. Let's see what the actual photos tell us. Of the four bedside table cabinet drawers, we have one fully open and one only slightly open. The one that is fully open contains the Xbox games and DVDs. They don't look disturbed, in the sense that if someone had been searching for Xbox games, they would have presumably actually searched the pile for Xbox games, and not just opened the drawer. Now the main dresser has eight drawers. Three of those eight drawers are partially open. Two of them are open below the jewellery box, meaning, going back to that demonstration that we performed, if you were standing in front of the dresser and those drawers were open, you'd be pushed back a little, making the poster situation even more difficult. Now if you'd opened the drawers after dropping the bracelet and watch, then you'd probably had a little bit more time than what was suggested and you simply could have bent down and picked up the bracelet and the watch whilst opening the drawers. And it's important to note that the contents of two of these drawers, and we can't see the third clearly to make a comment on that, but the contents of them appear to be entirely undisturbed. And then finally we have the jewellery box. And as I've described, I don't believe this was ransacked. I believe it is likely exactly as it has always been, complete with the necklaces draped over that right hand door. Now, let's look at a few other elements that perhaps suggest that an intruder wasn't in the room. We have a laptop on display beside the bed, complete with a charger sitting with it. We have a PV amplifier, and we have an instrument case, described as a harp case, that appears to be completely undisturbed, at least not opened to check what potential valuable contents could be in it. Now, in recent months, Liz has described exactly where her Xbox was stored in this room. And this is the white Xbox that has been claimed to have been stolen from the Melgar's home by an intruder. Liz claims that the white Xbox was stored under her bed on that back right hand corner, near to the bedside table that contains the Xbox games and DVDs. Now Liz claims that it would have been easily visible to any intruder. Now we'll put up the various photos of the room for you to decide for yourself, but think about this. 
You have an intruder searching through a room, perhaps in the dark or with a torch, and they are apparently rushed and nervous to the extent that they panicked and dropped a bracelet and watch, and grabbed a poster off the wall, and then didn't even bother to pick up the bracelet and watch that they dropped, that they were so desperate to catch. But they pass by a laptop complete with charger, they pass by an amplifier, they pass by an instrument case, they pass by a drawer full of DVDs and at least four Xbox games, and got down on their hands and knees to look under the right hand corner of the bed to find an Xbox. Now, I'm not sure, but that doesn't seem very plausible to me. Some of you may also be aware of some work that was done on the images of this room with respect to the carpet. And there appears to be vacuum marks on the floor. Vacuum marks that appear to be undisturbed by footprints. And this is the point where Bob begins to frame the story around Mr. Carpenter being biased. And yes, he starts to create another villain. To paint someone else with the brush that screams out conspiracy and corruption and a desire to wrongfully convict Sandra for the murder of Jim. Noting, and to use Bob's words, it is pretty clear that Maurice Carpenter already had his profile implanted deep into his brain before he wrote this report. And based on what so far? An entryway, uneventful, and a southeast corner bedroom which I think any reasonable person would suggest definitely doesn't appear ransacked or even searched through. Now the next room considered by Mr Carpenter is the guest bedroom, and that is where Bob next turns his attention. The guest bedroom contains a large armoire, as Bob describes it. Now for those not familiar with the term armoire, it originates from an old French word. An armoire is simply a tall cupboard or a cabinet. This one, or two, that are partially joined in the middle with a piece of timber, are made from timber, and you can see the photos of them on our website. They contain three internal drawers each, and two external drawers, making six internal drawers in total, and four external drawers in total. Of these ten drawers, not a single one is open. And next to that is an ironing board, complete with an iron and a spray water bottle on top. The iron and the water bottle are upright. And leaning against the ironing board is what appears to be a tabletop, a table without the legs attached. And Bob goes on to note what he sees, that someone entered that guest bedroom to look for something valuable. Bob notes, and presumably with information provided by family members, that the doors of the cabinets are normally kept closed because the Melgars considered them filing cabinets. And Bob notes how the cabinets look like they could contain, in his words, all sorts of treasures. Bob notes how an intruder very quickly looked for anything valuable. They didn't find anything and then they moved on. Firstly, let's consider what evidence there is of an intruder searching through the room. The armoire doors are open. That's it. What about the tabletop leaning against the ironing board? Well, Either these are rushed, nervous intruders who are quickly searching through rooms, or they are intruders that carefully placed a heavy tabletop against an ironing board in a way that doesn't even disturb the iron and the spray water bottle on top. So we have two rooms and one doorway in, and what evidence do we really have of an intruder? Not much. Rather, we have lots of items that, at the very least, you would imagine would have been of interest to an intruder. Now, at this point of the episode, Bob notes how the way for detectives to figure out if anything was actually taken from any of the rooms would be to ask family. And Bob emphasises that. To ask family, he says. Well, they did. Detectives Carazal and Doucet met with Liz on the 26th of December 2012, as you know. And they requested that Liz do that exact thing. Walk through the house and produce a list of items that she believes may have been missing. Now, the next room that Mr Carpenter moves to in his report is the study. And with respect to this room, Bob notes that it appears to him that any potential intruders didn't even enter this room. Interestingly, despite highlighting Mr Carpenter's reference in the report to the flat panel TV in the room, Bob doesn't make any further mention of it. And that was an error, and we'll explain why. Now for those of you who are members of our Facebook group, you'll be aware of the excellent discussions being carried on this week with respect to that particular TV. And I'll explain some of those discussions and the relevance of the television. It's been often stated that a television was stolen from the Melgar's home that evening, a 32-inch flat-screen TV. Now you recall how, on an earlier episode of Truth is Justice, we showed how Bob listed out a number of different TVs that were contained within the house. Bob, however, in that list, didn't note the 32-inch Sylvania TV. Now on April 1, 2013, lawyers acting for Sandra sent an email to Detective Carazol with an attachment containing a receipt and a retail sales inquiry. 
The receipt and sales inquiry related to a Sylvania brand 32 inch TV slash DVD combo, a flat screen TV. Email notes that this TV was in the home at the time of the incident, but that the family couldn't confirm whether it was located in the master bedroom. Interestingly, the receipt and the sales inquiry are dated the 7th of March 2013, indicating that they were reprinted on that date. Now, a couple of brief comments about that particular model of TV. It's heavy, nearly 28 pounds or over 17 kilos. This isn't a TV you're going to be able to quickly tuck under your arm as you walk past. The Sylvania TV also has a very distinctive base, as Tom in our Facebook group has identified, and that is where the TV in the office becomes very relevant. That base on the Sylvania 32-inch TV-DVD combo that the receipts relate to appears, based on the work Tom has done, to be identical to the flat-screen TV in the office. But the analysis didn't stop there. There's been suggestions that the TV in the office is smaller, and Bob made recent reference to it looking like a 19-inch TV to him. So how can we determine the dimensions of the TV? Well, some more excellent work by Tom on identifying the pre-drilled shelf holes on the side of the cabinet used to adjust the shelves. And they're visible in the photos taken by Mr. Carpenter. So by determining the standard space between those holes and getting the dimensions of that exact model 32 inch TV and some other sizes, including the 19 inch model, we can work out that space. And sure enough, it matches up perfectly to that 32 inch TV. So was this particular 32 inch TV stolen from the house? Now that photo by Mr. Carpenter and his reference to the TV in his report appears to strongly suggest that it wasn't. In my opinion, excellent work by Mr. Carpenter in that respect. The next section covered is the living room. And this is where Bob continues to lay in the boots to Mr. Carpenter and to continue his framing as yet another villain in this case, another person conspiring to convict Sandra for a crime that it's claimed she didn't commit. And Bob begins the discussion of this room by saying that Maurice Carpenter really outdid himself with respect to this room. Let's actually closely consider what Bob says. Let's look at the photos, and let's look at the information available to us, and I think you will see an entirely different story. Now, firstly, the shredded paper. Bob notes the references by Mr. Carpenter to the shredded paper, both in the report and in his photos. He highlights how these additions in the report were probably done by Mr. Carpenter to reflect that this was a staged crime scene, and that it was also a scene cleaned up by Sandra. There's nothing to suggest that. Mr. Carpenter highlighted something that was out of place, and something that appears in various places throughout the home. What's the relevance of the shredded paper? Well, perhaps nothing. Perhaps it is simply something disturbed by the four dogs, or perhaps it is more. And Mr. Carpenter provides the photographs and mentions the location of the pieces. Thorough work, in my opinion. And next comes the part that Bob claims is a significant failure by Mr. Carpenter. Bob highlights the existence of a cable protruding from the cabinet below the TV from what Bob describes as a big empty space. Now the dimensions of that big empty space that Bob refers to are very important, and I'll come back to that in a second. And Bob highlights how it is clear that there was a newer, high definition device in that space, and that obviously that device is now missing. And Bob makes the cringeworthy, well, at least for me, reference to a spoiler alert and tells his audience that the device that belonged in that space was an Xbox. Now perhaps that's an immediate thought that might come to mind, but let's have a closer think about it and consider it with all the information that we have available to us. Once again, we have some excellent photos to use as a reference to consider the dimensions of that space and the dimensions of the device. Firstly, let's look at the dimensions of the Xbox. Now we haven't yet covered this, but an Xbox was discovered in a backpack in the garage. And we'll discuss that in detail in a later episode, but for now, I'll direct your attention to the dimensions of that Xbox. Now we can determine the dimensions in a number of ways. We could look up the specifications online, and that's useful, but there are a number of different Xbox models with different dimensions, and inevitably, if we provide you with dimensions of one of those models, some listeners may say that it could have been a different model. So rather than finding the dimensions online, we can go one better. We can use the actual dimensions of the Xbox that is claimed to have been kept in that space in the cabinet. Now, fortunately, we have police photographs, complete with measuring tape, that show us the dimensions of that Xbox. Now, based on these photographs, the Xbox from the backpack, the one claimed to have been taken from the cabinet, measures just under 13.5 inches at its widest, and just short of 12 inches deep. 
Now the police photographs are on our website, but I'll extract out the specific images and place them in the podcast notes for this show on our website so that you can conduct your own measurements if you like. Now, let's compare that to the dimensions of the cabinet. And how can we do that? Well, the photograph shows a number of DVD cases which are sitting in that same space. And we know the dimensions of DVD cases, about 5.3 inches wide by about 7.5 inches high. So we can determine the space remaining beside them and the space available behind them. There's a black object behind the DVDs which extends to the right, meaning a device would either have to be narrow enough to fit past it or as shallow as a DVD case. And this black object looks like a DVD or a CD case, but we're not certain, so I'll just refer to it as a black object. So now to calculate the space remaining. So from quick measurements, and I'm being generous on the width, so allowing for even more space than is probably available in that area. After doing that, there's about 12.5 inches in width available. And the depth of space available, about 7.5 inches until you get to that black object. If you wanted to squeeze the Xbox past the black object, you only have about 10.5 inches of width to play with. So to summarise, I don't see any way the Xbox would have fit in that space unless you removed the DVD cases and the black object or shifted them in some way. But the fact that they are still there, and the discs on top of the cases are still there, means it doesn't appear to me that they have been moved at all, let alone disrupted in some hurried attempt to remove a wedged-in Xbox. Now, Even if you shifted the DVD cases onto their side, the black object remains a block, so the Xbox would protrude from the front of the cabinet by maybe about four and a half inches. But even if you did that, it wouldn't necessarily resolve the space issue. Now, there's a hole on the base of the space on the right-hand side that has cables protruding upwards through it. And from the measurements, the Xbox would extend over that hole, placing the device on an angle. It would lift up that back right-hand corner of the device. So unless you rearrange the contents of that space, which I don't believe an intruder would have done, I find it highly unlikely that the Xbox was ever in that space. You might ask why the space? Well, there's a power board about 10 inches back that all the devices plug into, and perhaps the space was to provide for ready access to that power board. I mean, the fact that the hole I mentioned earlier with the cables protruding from it exists in that area means it'd be difficult to place any device in that space. And again, thank you to Mr Carpenter for the crime scene photos and the investigators for the evidence photos showing clearly the dimensions of the Xbox fan in the backpack. That information allows us to make assessments like the one we have just done. As I mentioned, links to these photos will be included with the show notes, so don't just take my word for the measurements. Open the photos and have a look for yourself, and see if you arrive at the same conclusions. And with that, we're going to bring today's episode to an end. We still have a lot more to cover, and we'll continue to do that next week. And to wrap up today's episode, I wanted to quickly summarise what we have discovered from the rooms that have been covered that would support a theory that an intruder was present in the home. First we had the front door. Nothing. No sign there of an intruder. Then we covered the report and photos of the southeast corner bedroom. And whilst Bob claims the room looks as though someone came in and looked through all the drawers for something valuable and ransacked the jewellery box, we showed how the photos simply didn't support that. The jewellery box appears as though it was always kept open, as evidenced by the necklaces hanging on the door. And the bedside tables have two drawers each. Of the four drawers, we have two which are opened, one only partially, and the contents of both appear completely undisturbed. And we have Xbox games visible that are not removed from the drawer, and we have a pile of cases that are not visible, that appear not to have been sorted through. And onto the dresser. It has eight drawers. Three of those drawers are partially open, and the contents of two of those drawers look completely undisturbed, and we can't see clearly enough inside the third. Now, other items in the room also look completely undisturbed, including two large storage boxes in plain sight right next to the door. Then we covered the guest bedroom. And what was the evidence of an intruder, as Bob states it? The two open doors of the armoire. No drawers were disturbed, it doesn't appear any paperwork was disturbed, and other items in the room, such as suitcases, were seemingly left entirely undisturbed. Then we covered the study slash office, and Bob suggests that the intruders likely didn't even enter into that room. Then we covered the living room. The evidence of the intruder in this room, the, as Bob calls it, big empty space in the device cabinet below the TV, which Bob claims is evidence that the intruders removed the Xbox from that space. And we showed how the Xbox wouldn't have even fit into that space. And that is it so far. We have one fully open drawer, four partially open drawers, 
and an open armoire, and we don't have anything at all that appears to have been disturbed. Thank you very much for joining us on Truth is Justice. We look forward to you joining us next week as we continue to set the record straight. <laughs>